They don't even know what the word equity means. Yeah. They think it's a new song. What do they say about me? The re- you want the real stuff. <laughs> Are we recording? Well, right? easier said than done, right? Hey guys, welcome to another episode here on Easier Said Than Done with myself, Thomas Singh. And I wanted to talk to you guys a little bit about all the unexpected mishaps that we have gone through in the three years of doing close to like, I don't know, 150 projects or something, right? Now, these are things that you guys should take note on. And I'm sort of going to talk about a few key ones just off the top of my head in order, right? So you can see as I started out and I was quite a noob, didn't really know what I was doing, the mistakes seemed to be quite massive at the start, right? One of them was when I went through my whole buy and hold um buzz there and me and my dad were doing this and we bought one and say in Vicargo, right i went i bought it and we leveraged off our auckland property and we went hard with the leverage at westpac so we went bought one uh had our main mortgage with westpac on our auckland home bought another one another one and another one all on the same bank a lot of you guys will experience people will know oh no split banking and what this means was there was a certain time that you know, the family were like eyeing up what we're going to do cash wise. And I said, well, with this one here, it's probably the lowest performer. Why don't we just sell this one here in Invercargill? It's a big five bedroom subdividable land. And the profit there looks like around about 45 grand. So I said, why don't we just sell this one, take the money, you can chill out for a year or so. And we don't have to worry about money. That'll just be there to pay the mortgage and, you know, pay living expenses. What I didn't realize, and this is the tip here for you guys, is if you have all your money tied up with one bank, when it goes to sell, and it's unconditional, cool. Two days before settlement, I got a call from Westpac, and they go, hey, Tama, just saw that you guys have sold your property, settlement's in two days, there's about 45K left over, where do you want this money transferred to? And I said, oh, just send it to my everyday bank account, please. And they said, uh, which one's that? And I said, the one that's, you know, got uh, a few thousand dollars sitting there. They go, no, we, we need to transfer this to one of the mortgages. And I was like, no, it needs to go into our account. We, we, we plan to use that money. And they said, that's not how this works. Because you guys have cross-collateralized and leveraged all your existing lending with Westpac for all the other properties, we have first right to decide where this money goes to. And nine times out of 10, they want it to go to pay down debt because it reduces their it reduces their risk. So they basically said, you need to pay down a mortgage. We're not giving you this money unless you go through a full-on loan application. And because when you go to do a full-on loan application with a main bank, chances are you have done a good thing by cleaning up your accounts, making sure everything's tidy, making sure you've got clean bank statements, credit card statements, all that stuff. And obviously we weren't planning to go through this. And I knew, ah, fuck, did not know this. So they basically transferred it and paid down the debt. So we got no money when that house sold. And that was a huge fuck up. And I did not know that. And that is why people talk about the importance of split banking, where you might take out a new loan with ASB instead or ANZ uh, and not keep everything in one basket, which to us was Westpac at the time. Now, Second thing that I did not know when I was first starting out is especially when you're doing things that might include council with, uh, we did this conversion where we had to include firewalls and that was definitely council involvement, understanding the close down period of when council actually operate. Around December, it, they almost closed for two months. And then you have to realize that this is the same for everyone, where everyone's trying to get their bookings in for January. So they closed down, I think, like the 15th of December, and they did not open up until like the 20th of January. And even then, every other builder, every other investor had them booked in, it's a very small town, for like the next month. So we could not get a council inspection till like the end of February which was just crazy because you just have to be on complete standstill before doing any more work. So because we couldn't close the jib in or we couldn't do any of the plastering, the painting, we just had our tradies standing around doing nothing. This was like three years ago. And not knowing the close down period, but not just expecting that, oh, they're back to work on the 20th of Jan. Cool. Guess I'll see them on the 21st. Not at all how council works. So you have to be really onto it when it comes to scheduling those council um bookings well in advance understanding every motherfucker out there is trying to do the same thing so it really is a first come first serve basis for council because remember they don't take bribes um third third thing is um 
one that we did in Westport. This one's fucking out the gate here. So we bought this massive villa in Westport. My guys were down there renovating it. This is in 2021. And then all of a sudden, it, there was a break-in. Came there, five bags of tools were just completely stolen. Obviously, you could say we shouldn't have had them in the house, but it was quite discreet. It was off the street. You know, it was quite a lot of hedges. It was, you know, easily hidden. Five massive bags of tools gone, probably worth around about $15,000. Builder FaceTimes me, have a look at this, bro. We got broken into, and I was like, holy shit. Not only that, though, you think that was the worst time. He goes, wait a minute, come into the bathroom here. And I was like, okay. Switches the camera around, and he's like, look at what that is. And I'm like, without a shadow of the doubt, instantly that came out of my mouth, I was like, is that a human shit? Is that an actual piece of shit just sitting there on the ground? He's just like, yep. And check inside the vanity. Just some dude's just taking a piss inside the vanity with the fucking plug down. They've they've blatantly stopped the piss from going down the drain. They really wanted to let us know that some fucking beast of an animal human was there. And it was just finished being plastered and painted. And I was like, oh, my God, please tell me they have not smeared shit all over the walls. And he's like, nah, they've just smeared it all over the ground. Okay, fuck. And I, I don't I didn't know what to do. Right? I'm in Auckland down in Westport. And he's like, don't worry, bro. I'm going to go out there and I'm going to find this person. How? How are you going to find them? But people that I work with are very smart people. So he went out there and he saw this little kid riding around on a bike and he was just like to the kid, he's like, hey, yo, bro, do you know anywhere where I can buy some tools? So he put himself in the mind of an actual um, client of a thief because the thief has the tools. They're useless to them. This guy took his shit on the ground. Chances are he's a fucking meth head. So he's going to need money. So he went to the kid who's driving around on the bike in the area and he goes, hey, bro, I want to buy some tools, you know, where I can buy some tools. And he's just like, actually, yeah, I do know. There was this guy walking around with two bags of tools and he went down there. Out of the blue, the kid fucking walked them to the house where the tools were. And they went up to the dude's door, knocked on the door and he opens it. And behind him, sure enough, was three of the bags, three other five bags. And you, obviously you could have understand how f angry and frustrated it was because they're not, He's not just a thief that took the bags. It's a dude that they that took a shit on the ground. So that's a different level of angry. You as a viewer would be like, oh my God. So they did what they did, managed to tell him, like, you're going to go now and find those other two bags. He did. And then they walked him back to the house and made him clean it. Absolutely. Round of applause applause for them fucking eights so they made sure and they sent me videos of him on the fucking ground on his hands and knees wiping this shit down because they basically said well you're either going to go to the police now or you're going to clean this up and then find the tools and blah 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 so that was just another thing there and i guess the lesson there is just like obviously having good security some sites that we've um needed to have cameras up and even if you think that it is a discreet property it can still be broken into it's very handy to have insurance for your guys and all the tools in case they get stolen right but you can't really plan for someone taking a shit on the ground right um we've also had places um other other items get stolen from houses numerous times dishwashers hot water cylinders taken from the external so if you have an external hot water cylinder there's People that just come steal it for the for the copper. Those things are worth like two grand, two and a half grand. Um, and the worst thing, you know, they come in and take the chattels, the the oven hob, the grill, the range hood, everything, and they took the fucking front cabinets off the kitchen, which is the worst thing because when they steal the chattels, you can literally just go and get them that day. Bunnings might attend if you need to. But the kitchen cabinetry is sometimes a custom. They are built to size. They are on six weeks order. So when they took those, we were paranoid to the point where they're like, were they fucking planning on taking the entire kitchen? So that's why we had to anticipate that they were going to come back. So maybe we'd call the police, tell them to come by with a car just so maybe people are aware. You start questioning who the locals that came onto site that did the landscaping, the lawn mowing, the small handyman, who they're telling, oh, this house is vacant. I reckon you guys should go in there and make a quick buck. So you start to get a bit paranoid there, and I guess it just comes down to um, – mentioning it to all the trades that once dealt with the house. Hey, just letting you know we were broken into. Uh, we've got the police involved. 
did you hear anything? Did you see anything? You tell this to everyone that was involved in the job, so they're like, fuck. They might, if they were planning to steal again, they'll tell their guys, like, I think you should not. At least it's something you can do in your control that's free, right? Another thing there is trusting agents on their feedbacks for certain methods of sale. This one here always irks me the most. When I trust my gut instinct and I was like, ah, you know what, I'll listen to the agent. Agent might be like, I reckon this house is amazing. You guys did such a great job. I think we should go to auction. And you're like, why? And you really question them. They're like, oh, you know, it's really good. And there. And then you're like, well, I bought this house for a fucking steal from you at auction. So clearly your guys marketing to get bidders in the room to sign up was trash. And now you're anticipating me to do this, take it to auction, trust your guys marketing, and no one turns up to the auction room? Whatever, and then obviously they do what they do, and then sure enough, there's a certain price point in a certain town that once you get over the six mark, these people definitely need finance. And if you want top dollar, you have to be sort of subject to finance because people need time. They're pulling out equity. They're talking to their mom and dad about being guarantors. They're finding extra money they didn't know they have. They might need to sell the car, sell the shares, whatever. But if you want someone to be like absolutely straight unconditional, they're not going on with top dollar. So then I was like, fuck, I don't think we should go with auction, but I trusted their word. Sure enough, on auction day, no bidders. And I fucking knew it. And I said, we should have had this priced. And by the time we change our pricing strategy to buy negotiation or just a straight price, we're now in more competition. We obviously, we still sold it for a profit, but it was just the fact that I find if I, I knew that we should have just priced it straight away, maybe um, inquiries over 590 or asking price 595, et cetera. I just know that some agents want it to be auctioned because it's fucking lazy for them. They just open the door. People do their own due diligence. They don't have to draft up offers. They just wait for the one day and the fucking auctioneer does half the work anyway. So... Obviously, different areas, different agents will be listening to this and be like, oh, no, nah, it's a good option to do this and this. But sometimes you got to know, like, if you bought it for a steal because no one attended the auction, why would you go and put it back to auction and be the next sucker? Because that vendor clearly didn't get a good, um, good enough marketing campaign from the agents, right? Then there's just the small things there, which is like, of course, because we do a lot of our um, renovations in the regions and the towns. So that requires travel, that requires accommodation, that requires um, knowing the roads that are closed and all this type of stuff, right? So accommodation in certain small regions, especially when you get to the hot spots around summertime, you know, they, they have festivals on, you have to know about that because you might be looking at Booking this in and there's fucking nothing. You try booking.com, Airbnb, nothing, nothing, nothing. And um, yeah, it can really hold up the jobs. Road closures, we had this in 2021 with the with the floods as well in Westport where we had to leave. COVID clo lockdowns, snowing in the peak winter in the South Island. So you got to know all that stuff and how to pivot and uh, allow for that sort of buffer in the numbers. Because if they have to fly somewhere that costs three grand for the whole team and they can't do anything because the roads are closed or etc. then fly them back six grand. Gone, added to the numbers, right? So those are just some key things that have happened to me in the past. There's fucking way more than this, but these are just a, a good ones that some people might not have known about. And obviously this is the type of stuff that I'll break down a little bit more detail at the next seminar, which is uh, April 13th. So it's a full eight hours of the day that people can obviously ask Q and A's and they'll be replying back with stories where it's like, yeah, I heard that happened. And so many more other um, finance mistakes, which is one of the biggest ones, right? Because there's a lot of way to make money in property, but there's also a lot of money to actually lose money which is not good right cool so that is just the the feedback if you guys know any other fucking horror stories that you guys have have seen comment on it uh on the video send me a dm let me know and i can talk about it on like maybe the next one cool but yeah that's the episode of easier said than done because it's well timed with everyone wants to be a property investor but you see shit like this right <laughs>